Welcome back, War Room fans. Okay, here we go, War College. Video two, War College number two, I guess we'll call it. Uh, we talked about the importance of the turn order track. Now, let's go with the second most important concept in War Room, breakthrough combat. Okay, now, I think the video, let's just go by the rule book. Let's explain breakthrough combat, okay? Now I have, oh, where's my command stick of power? Where is my command stick of, oh, command stick of power has been found. So let's just talk about the rules of breakthrough, okay? So I'm gonna set up a combat here where let's just say, let's move the camera back, okay? So let's just keep it simple. On the opening turn, the 61st came into the Caucasus against the 57th, and the dice gods denied everybody a hit. So no one actually hit everybody. And so now we're talking on game turn two, okay? So how breakthrough combat works is, notice here that the Germans have one extra unit above the Russians. So the Russians have an artillery and four artillery. Germany has an artillery, or two artillery, armor, two infantry. And they have one extra armor, okay? So on turn three, let's put them back up. Okay, so Germany has a one unit advantage. And we're just gonna, okay, so, the thing about breakthrough combat is it gets a little convoluted because of other steps that are gonna happen, bidding for oil, and we're gonna get into that. But so the basic idea of breaking pinning is if the 61st, let's say wrote an order to go to R7, and Germany in this example goes first in the order of writing, What's going to happen is, because Germany has one extra unit, they can elect to unpin one of their unit types. It doesn't have to be armor. It could be artillery or infantry. But let's just say, in this example, they elect to unpin one armor. Okay, So one armor will then, on the second turn go into R7, and then we need to put a new command stack, and I'm not gonna reach into my bins, but a new command stack then appears here for the Battle of the Caucasus, okay? So that's how pinning works. If you ever write an order for a command stack, okay, let's define this, land command stack, or naval command stack, if you have, you have to leave an equal number of units. So in this case, the 61st leaves an equal number of units to the 57th, and then everything over that can then move. So on the beginning of turn two, 61st goes into the Volga, okay? Now, this is an unrealistic example. Let's let's make it a little bit more crazy, okay? So we have six units here, and let's just say the 33rd was with them. And they, because remember, you can only have eight guys in a, in a stack. That's the legal limit, okay? Let's just say that's how it was on the first turn, which, which is not possible, guys, okay? I'm just using this for the demonstration, okay? So now, 
you write your orders for the second turn and you write the 61st into R7, okay? And you get to go first. So Russia cannot react. They can't do anything to affect this situation. So basically what's gonna happen is Russia has five units, okay? So what the German player will do is go, well, I, my very first order was the 61st to go into R7, okay? But I have to leave five units. Well, we have the 33rd here because we have 10 total. So the 33rd will stay static because the order wasn't for the 33rd. They have to stay there. Now I have to, I have to match them. So I have to leave three units off the 61st, okay? We're just gonna leave it at this. We're just gonna say we, we split off three infantry. And so now the 57 and the 33rd is an equal stack, okay? And then the, six, then the remainder of the 61st engages the 21st. Now, that's the thing. Okay, so that's the actual rules of pinning. You have to leave an equal stack. If you write an order to, let's say, go up into R7, you have to leave an equal stack here and move all excess here. You don't get to choose like, well, I'm seeing what's going on up here. I'm gonna leave an extra unit or two behind here to ensure this or give me better odds. No, the rules of pinning are if in this situation, okay, let's just leave it like that. So we have three equal stacks. I wrote the 61st to go here I have to move the 61st there because the 33rd is an equal stack. So you can only ever move more units than whoever's in your territory, okay? So that's actually how the break pinning rules work. So you always have to leave an equal stack behind if you move out, and then you can move all your excess to wherever you want to go. And in this case, it's what? R6 to R7, okay? So that's how the actual rules of pinning work. Now, When it comes to what we've been discussing in all these previous strategy videos, okay, this type of scenario, in order to break pinning, requires you to, in the first video we did about the turn order, it's all about bidding for turn order. It's all about using oil. So let's, okay, so this type of combat here is if your plan is to break pinning to let's say go into Iran, because the Russians are more concerned about you going into the Volga or crashing into Bryansk on the next turn, you write your orders to go to Iran the Russians most likely are not gonna make their stand in the Caucasus. They're gonna to wanna to make their stand in Volga or Bryansk. So if you wrote, let's say on turn two, I write orders for the 33rd, okay? Now, because I rearranged the commands, but let's just say the 61st is an equal, and you wrote the order now the 61st is equal, the 33rd has five extra units, and you write the orders to go in Iran, they then go invade Iran, okay? But you have to leave those units there. You have to always leave an equal stack. Now, sometimes in the game, you write an order to break pinning, and 
you kind of, after you wrote the orders and then it's like 20 minutes later, you realize <clears throat> I really wanted to leave a lot of extra units in here to deal with the 57th. And this was kind of like a, you know, I, 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 I'm not saying I don't want to go to Iran, but I really only wanted to go to Iran with like two units. Well, that's the thing about the rules is if you're going to write orders to break pinning, you, it's, it's an either or. You either leave an equal stack and then move the other guys out or you cancel the orders. There's no, well, okay, well, it looks like I got, you know, I got uh, 10 units here. I can... Uh, Maybe I leave seven here and move three or I leave eight here and move two. No, it doesn't work that way in War Room. You have to leave the equal stack. So when it comes to breaking pinning, there is a, I guess you could call that as a negative. There is a downside to breaking pinning is that you're always going to leave the embattled territory, the Caucasus in this example, as an even stack battle. And then the excess moves off to either Iran or they come up here, they break pinning, go into the Volga, or depending on what you're doing on your bigger plan, on, you know, and then they come up to Bryansk, wherever. So you always have to leave an equal stack. Okay. So that's that's the thing about breaking pinning. But let's tie it back into the turn order video we did on the very first War College. This is a situation where if you feel you can get a big advantage over, let's say, we're, we're talking about Germany specifically, you can get an advantage over Russia or over Britain and Iran. Well, in order to do this, though, you need to go before Russia on the turn order. Because let's just say Russia goes, you know what? I think he's going to try to break out the 33rd either in Iran, which the British player is yelling at Russia, dude, you got to pin him down. We can't get him down in Iran. The Russian player is also worried about Bryansk and Volga, okay? So if you don't bid enough oil on the next turn, then let's just say, it, and we're going to leave this as just static. These are the starting units. We've talked about it in Cobra Kai. If you watched about it in my turn order video, there is going to be a lot more units up here. I mean, you might see something like akin to this, where, you know, Germany did the Cobra Kai, and on their second turn, they're all up here. I mean, they are all up in, they even bring in the Norwegians over here into Finland. So they are completely in Russia's face. So on that second turn, they wrote the 33rd to go to Iran, but they also wrote 48, 56, 38, 37, 72, all to crash into Bryansk, okay? So that basically will stop Russia from stopping a breakout from Caucasus, okay? The only way they can stop the breakout is if Russia goes before Germany and brings the 21st down, which will, because they're a four unit stack, but the thing is, the 33rd is a five-unit stack. So even in that scenario, let's just take the armor. So the 33rd, so they come down. So they're going to tie the 33rd down. And then Germany is going to make an, a separate command stack. And they at least get one unit into Iran. Okay. These breakout movements are the heart of the game. It goes back to the first video about turn order because the easiest way to make them happen is if you do the back-to-back -back movements. You go on turn seven, and then you go on turn first the next turn, where you can then, because if you did that in this example, 
the 33rd would have broken out to Iran, the 21st and 57th would have joined up. Now they have a numerical superiority in the Caucasus, but Germany did their goal. They broke out, they're now in Iran, they're threatening India, they're threatening the Middle East. And, you know, up here, Russia's in a world of hurt. You basically have the entire German army sitting in Bryansk, okay? And that's not even including other orders that they might have wrote where they're coming out of Scandinavia into Leningrad with the 22nd. So they're putting a lot of pressure on Russia, okay? But this video is primarily about this idea of equal stacks breaking pinning. If it's a set encounter, let's just say it's on turn three, and this is what it is. It's a, it's a contested territory. Notice 57 and 33 are equal stacks. 61 and 21 are not equal stacks. Germany has a one unit advantage, okay? So if Germany goes before Russia, they can write an order for the 61st and they can go to the Volga, they can come up here or go down to Iran, okay? It's the idea of you're moving your units forward into their territories, contesting them, maybe taking them, but you're making, in this example, Russia have to defend like the Volga because they might break pinning and come up here and just take it for free. Up here, the big issue with Russia and everything in Russia, and I haven't talked about the Russian strategies yet, but the big thing about Russia is Bryansk here is right next to Moscow. If Germany can come up with a stack like of this size, and let's just say the Russian player is defending the periphery like Leningrad. And, oh, no, I don't want you to take Leningrad. And he has all his troops over here. And then he did this. And we'll just say these guys came in here to help defend Bryansk. So notice the, Bry notice the Moscow defense is one less. The 23rd, the inherent unit in Bryansk is equal to the 72nd. So the 48th has a one unit advantage. And then we have these two units. So Germany has a one, this is a four stack, four stack. They have a nine stack, they have a nine unit advantage on Bryansk. So regardless of how this combat breaks out, okay? Let's just say the combat breaks out and both these eight stacks are gone. In a combat of this size, guys, you're gonna take 26 to 28 hits, okay? So the reality of the day is, if you take 26 to 28, you're gonna lose 13 to 14 units, okay? Let's just say it went really bad for the Germans and they lose both these, they take 30 hits. So they're only gonna be left with one unit left in this entire, these two eight stacks, okay? But on the flip side, on the flip side of this combat, you're gonna inflict 14 of these units are gone. Pretty much, well, they're gonna have like one unit left, okay? So even if all the armor go defensive, that's three hits each. So they got 12 hits there. They've got three armor, that's six. That's 18 plus five. So they only have 28 hits in this entire stack. So they might be left with something like one infantry against all these Germans. And so then on the next turn, Germany writes all these orders to go into Moscow and it just pins everything down. But here's the issue. Let's say Germany didn't go into Leningrad. Well, now all these guys can come in 
and pin all the Germans in Briance, because remember they got one, but you bring all these units in, they will pin every German unit. Comes back to the turn order, which we talked about in video one. It's about, you have to analyze the map. You have to look at what's going on, and then when you're, be, and this discussion happens like between resolution of combat and production. So like the Russian player needs to acknowledge that if I don't get all these guys back into Bryansk on the next turn, like I move first, I have to move before Germany pin all these guys so they can't get into Moscow. So you need to acknowledge this and realize that yes, okay, on my on my production board, I have six oil. I'm going to get six oil next turn. Maybe on my, not even maybe, Russia is almost to put to the point where they can't spend any oil on production. They have to get as much oil as they can. So in this case, it would be 12 that Germany needs to spend 13 oil to beat me from beating them to the punch, okay? This is a big deal. Breakthrough combat is the whole core of the game when it actually comes to the combat in writing orders, breaking, moving, moving into their other territories. And, you know, you, you can take them if there is no one there, but even if there's someone there, you at least pin them down. There has to be a combat. And if you, let's just say you can't take it, but you can embattle it. If you flip the Volga, they're gonna lose their iron. Iron's a big resource for Russia. You've denied them that. So moving into these other territories, the periphery territories that maybe in themselves aren't that great when it comes to uh, resources, it denies Russia these things. Russia, as I've pointed out in other German videos, is really poor. They only have six iron. Okay, notice here, here's three of their iron. There's an iron up here, that's four. Their other iron is all the way over here on this side of the map. So your Japanese ally could maybe deny them. But over here, you have four of their six iron all within striking range. You deplete Russia of iron, Russia has basically been reduced to an army of infantry. They can't build armor. They can't build artillery. Now, Russia does have the ability. One of their strengths is they have excess oil. They can always spend out of here two oil to trade with Mexico for three iron. So, but, but, they only have nine oil. I mean, nine iron. So the most Russia can ever build is like four artillery in a turn or a combination of armor artillery, a combination of nine. So this whole tie them down, break their pinning, go up here, go here, go here. Just you, you just start driving them mad because now they're having to defend all these territories because you're moving before them. Now, as I pointed out though in the first video, the cost of that is, is it does hurt your production, okay? If you're, specifically if you're Germany, if you're using your oil to beat Russia on the turn order, then on production phase, you're not building fighters and you're not building naval, okay? And to a certain extent, you could argue then, well, isn't just Germany a country of infantry? Yes, that, that's exactly how this game works. I mean, there, there's a balance. Now, Germany can trade with Sweden, get more iron, 
at a cost of five OSR, they trade their OSR because that's what their excess is. And then maybe you can get out maybe a couple armor units or, or maybe a fighter or something on the production phase. But the whole point is to take Moscow because that is the big victory condition city. You have to take R1. So, you know, when we talk about German strategies, it, it just always comes down to how much are you willing to sacrifice against the Western allies to take this Moscow area? Because this is ultimately what you have to take. Now, the way to achieve it is always through this breakthrough concept. Equal stacks, you have more than them, but in order to utilize that tactic, you're gonna have to have more units than these guys if you go first to break out. If you allow them, if they see it and you don't go first, they might bring in more units and let's just say the Volga here they bring in more units, and then next thing you know, you can't break out because they now have more units than you. So the breakout concept is really important, okay? So I'm gonna end this video on, let's just do a very simple battle. Equal stack, okay? If you write an order for the 33rd to go into Moscow, and this is how it is. They can't do it because the 57th has pinned them. If you have the 61st up here, and then you write the 33rd to go into Moscow, well, the 33rd will go into Moscow, and the 61st, because they're an equal stack, will pin the 57th, and so any orders written by the 57th will not happen, and, you know, Putting command stacks on strictly through video and not looking at the board is tougher than I thought. But anyway, you know what I'm talking about, guys. So these guys will break the pinning, okay? So it's always about equal stacks. If you write an order for a unit to move out, if it has more units than it's pinning, you get to move out the excess. But you always have to leave an equal stack here. You don't get to choose. It's not like, oh, well, you know, the 33rd, let's just say this is an eight stack. It's not an eight stack, but this is an eight stack unit. That's a four stack unit. And you write the 33rd, you go, well, I think I need to move six units and leave two in reserve. No, you have to move, you have to, you have to always do the exact match, okay? So I think that's one of the things reading on Board Game Geek, some guys have talked about that, some of the new guys, you know, just so they so they understand pinning, okay? And I will, whoa, whoa, I will get this down, guys. How to, how to move units without actually looking at the board and doing it through the video, but that's the big thing is I know the new guys are kind of confused. You always have to leave at least an equal stack. It's not either or. Well, actually it is either or. You either go right, I wrote the 33rd to come up here, okay? But the 57th is still here and you're like, well, do I want to kill the 57th? Well, if you leave both these, you will kill the 57th. But you have to make that choice. Well, I'll leave an equal stack and then we come up here, okay? And we'll talk about combat in a video coming up about how just, this will be a generalized conversation about just combat in general. What are your expectations in combat, okay? Because one of the things about War Room is I haven't seen anybody. It's been since like day one. People have been talking about, does anybody have a combat calculator? Like I could put in all my units. I put in their units. What are my expectations? There's too many variables in War Room to like if you put it in and you hit go, it says, oh, you have a 82% chance of winning this combat. 
or you have a 41% chance of combat, okay? Which is very common in games like Axis and Allies, which a lot of the guys who play War Room play Axis and Allies. Uh, so that, th th it doesn't apply to War Room. I've never seen anybody actually come up with a combat calculator for the game because there's too many variables. When you're using the battle board, there's various stances and various hits hit counts and stuff like that. And I'm gonna do another video on how you can just look at a combat like this and just do a very generalized, well, while, while everybody else is moving and you kind of know what you're gonna be doing, you can kind of look at these stacks and figure it out in your brain, but you gotta, it's, it's almost like card counting. You're, you're just calculating, you're, you're looking at it go, well, if they are all defensive, let's say, let's just take the 61st and 33 here. If you go, well, I know I'm gonna go defensive. I have three armor, so that's nine hits. And then everybody else is two hits. So I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's 14 plus nine. I know I have 21 hits if I go all defensive. So the Russians can only beat me is if they can inflict 21 hits and couple that with 21 hits of the right color combinations. So we're gonna have a discussion of that. I'm gonna do a different video on that uh, because that's another little subtle, uh, get better at the game. When you just look at stacks, look at possible combats, uh, how to calculate odds in your brain. And so then you know if these are good orders, bad orders, should you really be fighting this game or fighting this battle? Because in the, the big picture of the game is, War Room is a game of diminishing resources. Axis and Allies, like Global 40, is not, it is, but it's not to the extent of War Room. You can build a lot of units in Axis and Allies. And so on your turn, even if you calculated all the odds of all the combats on the board, you go, I'm figuring I'm gonna lose about 20 units, but on my production side, I'm gonna get in about 16. So I'm only down four total units. War Room doesn't work that way. You lose, let's say over multiple combats in one turn, you lose like 26 units and let's just say you're playing Germany, realistically, even if you put all your production into units, you're only gonna be building 10. You're on this big negative downward spiral and it affects all the nations. That's why when you watch some of our game recaps, when we actually play out to like turn six or seven, and the game is speeding up. The game is actually getting faster because all these stacks are all getting reduced. They're not to these big sizes. It basically just turns into, everybody just turns all their armies into big mono stacks. And on turn six, turn seven of the game, you like look around the entire map and realize there's only five combats in the entire board. Well, that's not because everybody doesn't want to kill everybody. It's because realistically, those are the only units I got left. I don't have units all over the board like we do at the start. There is units everywhere at the start of the game. Turn five, turn six of War Room. This ain't what the board's looking like. It's pretty much, well, half of this, a third of this. It's just basically just big stacks looking at each other and you know, deciding on who's gonna attack who. And that's a function of the production and it's a function of the one turn delay. The one turn delay is another big thing, which I'll revisit, I already did a video on that, but that's another big function of War Room, this one turn delay. Axis and Allies Global 40 doesn't have a one turn delay. You build when you start your turn, at the end of your turn, you get all your units immediately. War Room doesn't work that way. At the end of your turn, you build the units, and then at the end of your next turn, you get the units, and then on the third turn, you can actually move those units. 
So there is this huge delay in war room when it comes to uh, replenishing units. And because of the way production works, if you start getting into these big, huge battles of like 30 dice on 30 dice, trust me, guys, you're taking on average, unless the other guy is just gone on a cold streak of titanic proportions, you're taking 25 to 28 hits on these units. Don't know how that's going to break down. It all depends on the battle board. Every battle is unique. But, you know, a 30-on-30 30 30 where everybody has a large component of every color, you're going to be just taking hits left and right, and your army will be destroyed. And so will his if you're coming back in with 30. You just have to be prepared for that, okay? I'm going to do a video specifically on expectations of combat, okay? Like, what is the expectation if these two Germans attack the 57th? They're, I can't give you the actual battle calculations, but I can give you the expectation level. I can give you what you should see, okay? And we'll, we'll, we'll do a separate video on that. So this is how, so I'm gonna end it right now. The video has gone really long. In order to break, pinning it requires an equal stack so in this case 57 and 61 are equal so on my turn order and this will be a part of the turn or this will also be about the order writing video because this is really important you have to specifically write like your first command the 33rd okay because things can things can happen, guys get confused, and then they write, oh, well, I wrote the 61st to go before the 33rd. Well, then you need to leave the 33rd behind. Well, I didn't mean to do that. I wanted this, you know, so I, I wanted to leave the 61st, but because I screwed up my order writing, I wrote the 61st before the 33rd. Well, now the 61st breaks, and then the 33rd, 33rd is just pinned. So whatever order, so if you wrote orders for both, whatever order you wrote for him is negated because he's pinned. He, there's nothing he can do, okay? So I hope this helps you guys on the pinning, okay? Now, the follow-up video is going to be about pinning, but specifically related to naval. And... Naval is a big aspect of this game because the Allies completely rely, well, United States and Great Britain completely rely on naval power. And so you can kind of take advantage of them. And Japan relies completely on naval power. So the United States can take advantage of them. And this is in respect to all this pinning. So my next video is going to be about the naval aspect of the game, specifically doing like Sea Lion, how Germany can use these pinning concepts. These are land concepts I just talked about, but use them on the naval side to break pinning to, let's say, do Sea Lion and invade Great Britain. Or the United States uses their superior naval power to overwhelm Japan to break pinning on Operation Downfall, which was the actual operation that was planned for the destruction of Japan, the land invasion. This happens a lot in war room with Japan, that Japan doesn't see what the United States is doing, and they come in and do Operation Downfall on them, and it's all over. And it has everything to do with breaking naval pinning, where Japan can't react. And then next thing you know, the United States dumps 16 units, two stacks in Japan, and they only have like five guys there, and it's all over. Okay? So, next video coming up on the series of War College will be, we're going to talk about the naval pinning and I'm only going to focus on Great Britain, but it applies to Japan equally. 
but we're gonna incorporate more concepts about the, so we're gonna keep building on the series. Bidding for oil, how do we break naval pinning so that Germany can come in on turn two into Great Britain, okay? And then we're gonna follow it up in that video. Ralph's gonna talk about other videos I've done like UK's London Calling, United States, Rainbow Five. These are all plans to try to stop Germany from coming out into this A6 zone and breaking pinning navally on us so that then they can bring in all these guys into Great Britain, okay? So I'll be back with that video. Talk to you later, bye.